I want to tell you about one of the most important relationships in my life. We spend a great deal of time together every single day, hours of focus time. In fact, sometimes when we're together, everything else just seems to fade into the background. It's often the first relationship that I engage with in the morning and and the last one that I engage with before bed. I haven't always had this particular relationship, and my life before and my life after couldn't be more different. Prior to this relationship, I I often found myself feeling like lost or, or even alone, but not anymore. This relationship has filled those holes in my day and in my life. Now, I should tell you also that not everyone loves this particular relationship of mine. Sometimes I worry that we may even have an addictive relationship. And I'm not saying they don't have a point. I'll confess that that I don't like it when we're apart. And when I feel distance, it can actually be anxiety producing in me. And one of my biggest priorities is doing whatever it takes every single day to keep this relationship alive. In fact, sometimes I even carry a portable charger. Now, of course, I'm talking about my relationship with this, this beautiful phone. (laughs) And everything I just said is, is completely absurd, but also, by the way, completely true. And if the research holds up, then most of the people watching this today have a similar relationship with their smartphones. Now, if you wonder if you do, let's try this, a little quiz. A psychiatry professor named Dr. David Greenfield developed the Smartphone Compulsion Test. It's a series of 15 yes or no questions that determine where you are in your relationship with your phone. So let me just ask you a few of the questions from that test and let's see how you do. So question number one, do you find yourself mindlessly passing time on a regular basis by staring at your smartphone? Yes or no? Question number two, Do you sleep with your phone under your pillow or next to your bed regularly? Yes or no? Question three, do you find yourself viewing and answering texts, tweets, emails at all hours of the day and the night, even if it means interrupting other things that you're doing? Yes or no? Question four, when you eat meals, is your phone always right there as a part of the table place setting? Yes or no? And finally, question five, Do you text, email, or scroll while you're driving or doing other activities that require your focused attention and concentration? Yes or no? Now, that's just five of 15 questions, but how did you do? If you only answered yes on one of them, you probably don't have a smartphone, right? But if you answered yes on three, you're likely experiencing some problematic or compulsive use. And if you answered yes on all five, well, I think I might be starting a support group for behavioral addictions. Uh, Maybe you want to join me. And today, I want to have a conversation about this relationship, our relationship with our devices, because this relationship hasn't yielded the, the flourishing life that God has called each of us to and He wants for us. And we need to talk about how choosing the right limits when it comes to screen time for ourselves and for our families might be one of the most transformative decisions that you can make this fall. Throughout this series, we've been challenging parents to be intentional about the habits that are are forming your household. And it's also important to note that this series isn't just for parents. The habits we're talking about apply to all of us because here's the reality. Our habits are forming us, and they're forming us for either good or, or for bad. And They're forming our kids too. The question we've been wrestling with is this, are our habits helping us? Are they helping our kids? Are they helping our families grow in the thriving life that God has for us or not? In John's gospel, Jesus tells us this. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. Our habits can become kind of like like a trellis system that helps us and, and helps us remain in Jesus, and it supports our growth as followers of Jesus. And by intentionally informing good habits, 
We're actually creating a structure in our lives that fosters spiritual growth and deeper connection to God, to Jesus, the vine. So throughout this series, we've made this resource available to you. This was designed for you to use with your family or on your own in order to help you in this journey of habit formation. Our prayer is not that you would just do more stuff. Our prayer is that this will be a simple tool that will help every person in your household grow as a disciple of Jesus over the course of this next year. And a critical piece of this for most, if not all of us, is to address the habits we have around our phones. Our relationship with our digital devices is pushing other relationships in our lives into the margins, including often our relationships with God, the church, and with the world. And I think by taking a closer look and adjusting our digital habits, we can make room for more meaningful relationships and spiritual growth as we challenge ourselves to to form habits that lead to a thriving life in Christ, the vine. Now, it's important that we start by saying this. Smartphones aren't inherently bad. There's a reason why many of us have formed such a close relationship with our phones. They provide us with a, a cornucopia of conveniences that were really unimaginable just a couple decades ago. And I don't know about you, but I like being free to reach people that I care about, and I like being able for them for them being able to reach me too. I like the freedom that comes with GPS and instantly having directions to anywhere I want to go. Well, unless you're driving on Lower Wacker and this phone is completely useless down there. I like the freedom of having my camera with me at all times. I, as a dad, like the freedom of being able to share my location with my kids when I need it. I like the freedom of accessing all of my financial accounts, calendars, and any random information that I might be wondering about in any particular moment. However, despite these advantages, we have to be honest with ourselves about some of the growing problems with an omnipresent smartphone. For adults, Excessive use of such devices can result in reduced attention spans, increased stress, and and even addiction. According to a study by the American Psychological Association, 43% of Americans reported that they are constantly, constantly checking their emails, their texts, or their social media accounts, which, of course, significantly increases their stress levels. And while these problems are significant for adults, they're even more pronounced and serious for the next generation. This is where the research of Jonathan Haidt, a prominent social psychologist, becomes particularly relevant. In his book, The Coddling of the American Mind, Haidt discusses how the rise of smartphones and social media has contributed to creating an anxious generation among our young people today. Haidt's research highlights several troubling trends. Increased anxiety and depression. Since the introduction of smartphones, there has been a sharp increase in anxiety and depression among teenagers. According to a study published by the Journal of Abnormal Psychology, the rate of major depressive episodes in adolescence increased by 52% from 2005 to 2017. This rise correlates strongly with the development and the release of smartphones and social media. Another issue, social social isolation. Despite being more connected than ever before, today's youth often feel more isolated. Hate notes that social media can create a false sense of connection while while actually reducing face-to-face interactions. A study by the National Institute of Mental Health found that adolescents who spend more time on social media were more likely to feel isolated. Further social research supports Hate's findings. A study conducted by Jean Twinge, a professor of psychology at San Diego State University, found that teens who spend five or more hours per day on their phones are 71%, 71% more likely to have at least one risk factor for suicide. Their research also indicates that high levels of screen time are linked to lower levels of happiness and overall life satisfaction. These are just a few data points from a growing sea of data. And if you're interested in learning more, I would strongly encourage you to read Jonathan Haidt's new book called The Anxious Generation. 
I think when you look around, you can see this. Our kids are struggling. Maybe you have a kid in your home who is struggling. And so while smartphones offer a ton of conveniences, they also bring significant risks, especially for our younger generations. These devices, they're shaping the mental health and social well-being and behavior of our children in ways that we're only beginning to understand. That's why we need to do better. We need to develop healthier patterns for ourselves and for our families. So let's look at what the Bible has to say about smartphones. Now, there's an obscure passage in the book of Acts where one of the disciples had an Android and it was messing up the group chat. <laughs> of course, I'm just kidding. But there actually is a scriptural basis for what we're talking about today. It's more than just general wisdom. Over and over again, the writers of Scripture tell us that in Jesus, we're free. And yet, the church has always wrestled with how to live out that freedom in good and healthy ways. Smartphones aren't the first time a new freedom has entered the culture. They also aren't the first time that culture has struggled to engage freedom in a way that leads to flourishing. Now, as you know, as you look at the early church in the first century, the family of God is expanding beyond the Jewish people and into the whole Gentile world, all people. And the goal is that the people of God would all be walking together in unity as this new extended family. But the problem is that there are traditions and constraints for the Jewish people from the time before. Dietary laws, laws on circumcision, to name a few. Laws that are unheard of for Gentile people. Now, through Jesus, the moral law was fulfilled and upheld, but the ritual laws and practices are no longer necessary for God's people. Now, following Jesus is to be the defining mark of God's people, not the ritual practices around like the temple or food, for example. And it's James, actually, the brother of Jesus, who says this. He says, we ought not to make it difficult for people to come to Jesus by laying the old void ways of living on top of the necessary thing, the only necessary thing, which is following Jesus. It was a time when the new freedom in Jesus was being explained and it was being lived out for the first time. All of it was a part of, of what God was doing in the world, of, of creating this new extended family to help even more people find their way back to God. It was a welcome freedom, but it, it was a new freedom. However, as often happens in our culture, this new freedom also created some new problems. In 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul is addressing the ritual dietary laws. And the good news is that bacon is back on the menu and people are understandably excited, except that some people were using this new freedom in a way that was creating some significant tension and even division in the church. Essentially, the problem was that some people were eating meat and, and that had been meat that was sacrificed to idols, other false gods. And while they were technically now free to eat whatever they wanted, this particular practice was offending some people, it was confusing others, and it was even causing some new believers to stumble kind of back into their old ways of life and false worship. These new freedoms were creating some new problems. So Paul writes this. He says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. In other words, Paul is saying, yes, I, I want you to be free and I want you to enjoy your freedom. But not everything that can be done should be done. Not everything that is permissible is, is actually good for you. Paul doesn't give these people a new set of laws that they have to follow. Instead, he pushes them to choose healthy constraints for themselves and their families. It's expressed in another way in Paul's letter to the Galatians. Again, Paul is addressing the newfound freedom that people are experiencing. But once again, the expression of this freedom isn't creating healthy, united, flourishing communities. It's, it's becoming divisive. So Paul writes this. He said, it is for freedom 
that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. In other words, Paul is saying, yes, you are free, but don't be naive about how you exercise that freedom. Used foolishly and without constraints, what started as freedom can actually, it can enslave you. It can become a destructive force in your life and, and even an addiction that will ultimately take so much more from you than it could have ever given. The early church was learning something that every generation since has also had to learn, that God's desire for us is freedom. But in our humanity, we tend to abuse freedom. And that doesn't always have to result in sin for it not to be good for us. What we discover is that freedom can only really be experienced as freedom within the, the correct limits. And I think this principle is really illustrated so well by a study a team of, of all people, landscape architects, did about playgrounds. See, what they found is that by observing teachers and their students on a playground surrounded by a fence and on a comparable playground with no fence, the researchers found an incredible difference in how the children interacted with the space. On playgrounds without fences, the children tend to stay really in the center, towards the middle. Even though there was a ton of more land and space for them to explore, they tended to stay close to the teacher. Now, on playgrounds that were fenced, they ran all over the place. They used the entire space, the entire playground, feeling free to explore. See, the researchers concluded that, that with a boundary, with an appropriate boundary in place, this case, it, it was a fence. The children felt more at ease to explore the space. They felt more free. Now, even though it may sound counterintuitive at first, the same is true for us. We can experience more freedom when we choose the right constraints the ones that lead to, to personal and relational flourishing. Now, let's go back to this. Let's go back to our smartphones. We've only had this new freedom for a little while now in history. And while their utility is obvious and exciting, we're just now beginning to understand it. It's psychological, it's social, and it's cultural impact. And there is now overwhelming evidence that using these little devices without limits can actually lead to a detrimental bondage to them. But choosing the right limits can actually result in freedom. So let's explore how, how a limiting habit can actually become a, a liberating habit. I know it may sound small to some of you, but choosing a different relationship with your phone can actually profoundly impact all of your relationships. This is about setting intentional boundaries that allow you to experience life more fully and more deeply. Setting limits for yourself and for your family can actually create a more free, healthy, and connected environment for everyone. Now, keep in mind, if you do have kids in your home right now, especially tweens or teenagers with phones, none of this will be popular at first or maybe ever. But these habits will help break through the bondage of screen time and advance your freedom and your relationships. Now, let me give you some examples of some potential liberty, liberating screen time habits. First, consider this, screen-free mornings. Years ago, I noticed how much time I was spending on my phone, especially in the mornings. I would wake up and just reach for my phone, and before I knew it, 15, 30 minutes had passed. Now, I realized this habit was, was not only wasting time, but it was also setting like a hurried and worried and distracted tone for the day. I would check the chaotic headlines, I would peek at my flood of emails and flip through some form of social media, and it became my habit. But it wasn't good for me. It was a freedom I had, but one that I was becoming enslaved to. So I decided to implement a no phone before prayer rule. <laughs> Instead of scrolling through news or social media, I started my day with prayer and reading scripture before I ever checked anything else. This small habit had a huge impact on my life. My mornings have become more peaceful and focused 
and I felt more present with my family. Here's another liberating limit to consider. Screen-free meal times. This will help your kids focus on their studies and actually engage with the family during meals. We implemented a no phone at meal times rule in our home, and it has been so helpful. Instead of everyone being glued on their screens, watching a show, or doing whatever they're doing on their phones, we have good conversations, and it's really helped to, to strengthen our connections with one another. Here's another one. Screen-free family fun nights, right? Designate one night a week as a screen-free night. Not just phones, but any screen. Play a board games, go for a walk, engage in a creative activity together. These nights can become cherished traditions that build lasting memories, spending more time face-to-face -face and less time looking at a screen. Or how about this? Screen-free car rides, right? Use your car rides as an opportunity to talk with your kids, listen to audiobooks, or, or simply enjoy the scenery. Sometimes this side-by-side -side time as a parent with your kids can be incredibly valuable, and this practice can turn a mundane activity into valuable family time. Now, so far, I think these are pretty small but helpful limiting habits for you and for your family, but I wanted to give you one big one, right? One big one to consider. And I know this won't be popular, but, but I want to ask you just if you would stay with me to consider it. Just consider this step, just even for a moment. Let me start with the why, and then we'll get to the what. We already talked about the objectively negative impact social media is having on our kids, but I want to get really specific, right? What happens is in our brains, the brain undergoes just massive, significant changes during early adolescence, a period that roughly spanning the ages of, of like nine to 15 or 16. This stage of development is, is marked by heightened sensitivity to social feedback and a stronger need for social acceptance and belonging. And the reason for that is the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for executive functions like decision-making and, I don't know, impulse control, is still maturing during these years. This makes adolescents particularly vulnerable to the pressures and the influences of social media that has resulted in so much of what we already discussed. Increased anxiety, increased depression, increased social isolation, increased bad sleep, increased self-harm, increased suicide, and so much more. You see, in light of these stats, there has been a discussion going on about when social media should be introduced or even allowed. Researcher, the one I mentioned earlier, Jonathan Haidt, who uh, has an incredible amount of research on this, has made a really compelling argument, in my opinion, based on the social research and everything we know about brain development, that it should be illegal. Yes, you heard me, illegal for kids under the age of 13 to be on social media. And his argument is that 18 is really the ideal age to introduce it. He argues that we should treat it like we treat any other freedoms that are especially damaging or dangerous for young people, like alcohol or smoking or driving a car. But I want to offer you maybe something a little more moderate, but, but still something I think may be unpopular or radical or countercultural for today. However, I really think this could just be the best thing that you could do for your kids. You ready? Okay, here goes. No social media before the age of 15 or 16. Now, I know if you're like me, who's got teenagers in your house, this is going to be hard. I've heard some parents lament that they don't want to be the bad guy or keep their kids from having something everyone else seems to have. Trust me, I totally get it. But hear me and hear the research. Social media is doing harm to our kids. They're not just ready for the pressures and, and the feedback that's constantly provided through these apps. Their brains aren't ready. And delaying social media exposure protects their mental health, and it allows them to develop more meaningful offline, face-to-face -face relationships. Parents, Please do your homework on this. If you don't trust what I've said, do the research yourself. Read it, take it, and then take action. Your kids will probably never ask you for help, nor will they want or like your help, but they need you. They need you to step up. 
They need you to get informed. They need you to get engaged. I know that this will probably be very difficult, but again, this could be the best and most important habit that you could introduce for your teen's development. I really believe you could change the trajectory of their lives by setting this constraint. Remember, limiting habits can be, when they're well-chosen, liberating habits. So, where do we land with this conversation? First, we need to acknowledge that these devices, these phones, are remarkable tools. Our ability to connect and to communicate and to manage our lives, to capture pictures and videos of the moments and the people that we love, it's all quite incredible. And it represents a freedom that generations before us could hardly even imagine. But second, the research is showing us that what feels like freedom has begun to enslave us. Our devices are incredible tools, yes, but they, they make terrible masters. So we need to turn to God and we need to look for wisdom. We need to ask him to help us choose healthy constraints that lead to flourishing. So let me offer you a challenge. Pick one of the habits from this list when it comes to your phones and when it comes to setting up a habit for yourself. Maybe try the no phone before prayer rule and see how it changes your day or establish a, a screen-free family fun night and, and notice the difference in your family dynamics. Think about the difference. Think about the difference of no longer being enslaved to your smartphone and think about what an impact that could make in your life and in your kids' lives. Because the truth is, I don't want to be in a relationship with my phone. I want to be in a relationship with my wife. I want to be in a relationship with my kids. I want to be in a relationship with my friends. I want to be in a relationship with my neighbors. I want to be in a relationship with my small group. And most of all, I want to be in a relationship with God. After all, it's for that kind of freedom that Christ has set us free. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the freedom that you've given us in Jesus. Now we pray you would give us the wisdom as we navigate these newfound freedoms in our culture and in our world and in our lives in a way that would lead to a deep abiding in you, a connection to you, the vine, rather than to enslavement to something that we really don't want. And so, Father, would you grow our relationship with you? Would you grow our relationship with one another? And would you help us set wise constraints around our smartphones and our screen time that would lead to our flourishing? We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.